just overcast, cold, dreary, 36 degrees currently in normal. Nice view though on the Dr. Lloyd's Lee camera. We are tracking some rain pushing in from the west. We've got showers and knocks in Fulton counties. That'll become more widespread as the night goes on. Most of the rain is going to be out of here by 9 or 10 o'clock, leaving us with overcast skies, areas of fog and drizzle. We'll have that full forecast coming up. WMED News at 10. So Tonight, excitement in the Twin Cities. The economic impact of the Illinois State University hosting high school football state championships. Also helping the environment in the capital. How one Central Illinois University is one step closer to eliminating carbon emissions. Then making beds for students. The program that expanded to multiple schools and a story that's making us Central Illinois proud. We begin tonight with a consumer alert. Gas prices are at the lowest they've been in 22 months nationwide. Some prices are under $3 a gallon here in Illinois. At the beginning of the new year, the freeze on gas tax increases will stop, so heads up on that. Lower gas prices are making the holiday travel easier for families. Carrie Amagoni does a lot of traveling, living in Woodford County and working as a nurse in McLean County. She says she spends at least $100 a week on gas, and the lower prices now means more family travel. It's good for Christmas now, especially, and that prices are going down. I'm able to take our daughter more places. We're able to spend more time together as a family and take a little bit more trips. When it was almost $5 a gallon, we weren't really doing anything at all, just staying home, which is unfortunate. I was just coming to work and then just staying home. According to AAA, the average gas price nationwide this time last year was $3.34. And today the average is 333. At the beginning of the new year, again, the freeze on gas tax increases in Illinois will end. And the Twin Cities High School State Football Title Games will once again be played in normal. An estimated 25,000 fans over two days will watch the 16 best teams in the state compete. Those fans spending money in bars, shops, and hotels, an estimated $2 million boom in tourism revenue. It's the first time Illinois State University hosts the game since 1998. Since then, the area has grown, and Hancock Stadium has undergone $23 million in renovations. As you mentioned, all the new folks coming to town through new employment opportunities with Rivian and otherwise. Yeah, it's, it's a hotbed for activity, and we're trying to do our part in that to create more opportunity for locals to go out and participate or spectate at some of these events. The five year deal will see the football title games hosted right there from 2023 season all the way through 2027. Bloomington Normal also hosts girls volleyball, girls basketball and numerous other state title events for IHSA. New businesses may be welcomed into Canton in just a few years. Back in 1997, the International Harvester site in Canton, now known as Navistar, caught fire. 25 years later, the city of Canton has finally reached an agreement with the company to get the land cleaned up following bad environmental conditions. Navistar agreeing to pay $2.1 million 30 days after they received the no further remediation notice. They also have 60 days from December 6th to send the city a draft work plan for the site. The council approved the agreement with Navistar 7 to 1, and now the city can work on a project that's been dormant for over two decades. A year ago, we reached out to them, asked them if they would come back to the table, and um, they, uh, they said they would, and we, uh, it took us 13 months this time to get, to get an agreement with them. As for the $2.1 million, Mayor McDowell says the money will be spent on the old site, but for now, the money will be put away so that city leaders in the future can decide the specifics. In a crime alert now, Peoria police have arrested a man in connection to the city's 17th homicide of the year. It happened on September 3rd at the intersection of West Adrian Hinton Avenue and North Grove Street in Peoria. The victim there was 24-year-old Jamarian Lee. Today, police arrested this man on your screen, 24-year-old Dominique Linwood. Linwood has been arrested for a list of charges, including first-degree murder and armed robbery. He's currently in jail. To see more information on the other charges that he faces, visit our website, ciproud.com. In a developing story, the Illinois Department of Corrections responding to the rally outside the Pontiac Correctional Facility yesterday. 
Dozens of Ask Me Union members picketed after a correctional sergeant was stabbed in the neck by an inmate two weeks ago. Critics cite staffing shortages that are creating safety issues. The IDOC released a statement today saying in part, it recognizes that our facility staff face demanding and challenging situations daily to make our state safer. Following the incident at Pontiac, security specialists from across the state were sent to the facility to conduct cell searches and inspections and an investigation is ongoing. And state capital news, Champaign Senator Scott Bennett was hospitalized this morning, according to a spokesperson from his office. They released no additional information about what led him to being in the hospital. He's being treated at Carl Hospital, though. He was first appointed to the Senate in 2015, and since then, he's become a prominent member of the Illinois Senate, most recently negotiating major changes to the Safety Act on behalf of the state's attorney association. He's also the chair of the Higher Education Committee in the Capitol, working closely with the University of Illinois. New tonight, the U of I Research Institute broke ground on its carbon capture pilot project at the Springfield Water, Light and Power Dahlman plant. The project is meant to reduce and eventually eliminate carbon emissions. It's a large pilot testing project meant to demonstrate how the technology all works. Our Capitol Bureau reporter Theodora Kulavaris has more. The state is moving towards a clean energy future, but city water, light and power coal plants are still churning pollutants into the sky day after day. But the University of Illinois Prairie Research Institute has a solution, carbon capture technology. I think this is uh, almost a keystone for the next 10, 20, 30 years uh, of managing internationally, globally, our energy futures. Uh, and so we're excited to be part of it. We're bringing our experts to bear on it. Here at the CWLP Dahlman plant, this is where they're going to be building the carbon capture project. And that's meant to help eliminate carbon emissions. What we need to do is reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it becomes very important to separate out the carbon dioxide from the nitrogen. When the state passed the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act in 2021, coal plants like CWLP in Springfield agreed to clean up emissions to keep their plants running until 2050. This is part of a long running effort by the city to get a head start, but it's also an opportunity to refine the technology and take it much further than just central Illinois. This type of technology would be able to be utilized throughout the world and uh, create jobs and open up global markets that aren't only economically beneficial, but also environmentally beneficial. Reporting in Springfield, I'm Theodora Kulavars. Here's a story making us central Illinois proud. The Bed Blitz program partnering with Washington Elementary School in Bloomington to make beds for students. Our Brianna Rittman attended the Bed Blitz and what made tonight so special, Brianna? Well, Shelby, Mark, at the 7th Annual Bed Blitz earlier this year, the director said he wanted to expand to local schools. It didn't take long for that wish to come true. Tonight, the Bed Blitz program partnered with Washington Elementary School in Bloomington to host a mini build. This time, 10 beds will go to students at the elementary school. Along with the bed frames, they will receive a mattress, linen, quilts, books, and laundry supplies. Washington is the first school in District 87 to host a mini build. And Principal Zach Freeman says he loves helping kids and he's excited about the partnership. It's, it's great. I, I'm very excited and uh, I couldn't be more proud of all the people in the room and uh, I hope that the families feel the same way. Now the director says there will be a bed blitz in Peoria next spring. Shelby. All right, Brianna, very cool. Thank you so much. There they go. That is the sound of the neighborhood house in Peoria celebrating its 125th anniversary. A history wall was unveiled tonight to celebrate their supporters. Pictures lining the wall at the neighborhood house to commemorate the history of the organization. It was founded back in 1896 and the organization provides services like Meals on Wheels, adult literacy programs, GED and youth programming as well. Peoria Mayor Ria Ali gave a proclamation praising neighborhood house House for having a strong mission, strong leadership, and strong support. The youth and after school summer 
program. We have so many, you know, great pictures from many years ago, a lot of supporters, um, and we wanted to take the time to you know, celebrate during the pandemic when we couldn't. 125 years is something to be proud of. Yeah, and with what 125 years, it took a lot of digging through archives and about a year to put that history wall together. Well, scattered showers are now beginning to push back into central Illinois. Take a look at Viper. You can see those showers mainly west of Peoria. The rain becomes widespread overnight. We'll have your forecast coming up next. You're watching WMBD News, Central Illinois Proud, with Mark Welp, Shelby Roberts, Chief Meteorologist Chris Yates, with your local weather authority forecast, and Kurt Pegler with sports. This is WMBD News at 10. The Storm Tracker SkyCam Network, brought to you by Linco Precision Ag Technology Solutions. Now, your local weather authority forecast from Chief Meteorologist Chris Yates. Welcome back. Overcast skies, rain pushing into central Illinois. This is the current view on the Brave Law Center camera. We've had a few spotty showers earlier. Temperatures are now holding in the mid 30s north of I-74, and it's a mixed bag of 30s and 40s further south. But these are about as low these temperatures are going to go. In fact, uh, we've seen them warming up a little bit in Peru as our rain starts to push in. Already seeing showers out in Galesburg pushing into Canton and Havana. As we go through the remainder of tonight, rain becomes more widespread and should continue into early tomorrow morning. Uh, thankfully, with this system, the concerns for freezing rain and snow should stay to our north. But if you are traveling up towards Chicago, Rockford area, you're probably going to be dealing with a little bit of a wintry mess, and it only gets worse as you head into Wisconsin, northern Iowa, and parts of Minnesota. In fact, we've had very heavy snow falling in Sioux Falls, had a few lightning strikes, so some thunder snow ongoing out of this system. It's small, 
but it is packing a little bit of a punch to those that are really under the influence of the winter side of things. Now this system blows through pretty quickly by tomorrow morning. The worst of this is out of here, but we're still dealing with cloud cover and fog and perhaps even a little bit of drizzle into tomorrow afternoon. Here's what it looks like, at least at the uh, local level. Rain becoming more widespread. Wouldn't discount the possibility of a lightning strike or two along and south of Interstate 74. Main freezing rain concerns, though, really start to ramp up as you get closer to Chicago. Even then, I still think pavement temperatures are going to be warm enough that most roads probably won't be terribly slick. But lows tonight, mid to upper 30s, some 40s out there in Peoria. Peru, you've already set your low and you're starting to warm back up. As we go through tomorrow, best chance of rain is before 9 o'clock. Otherwise, expect low clouds, fog, and drizzle to persist for much of the afternoon into the evening. Storm total rainfall from this system, half inch to three quarters of an inch north and west of the Illinois River, and then less than a half inch as you head further east towards Interstate 55. Highs tomorrow should reach the low to mid 40s. We'll briefly get to around 46 from Peoria to Bloomington, but Peru is going to struggle uh, to even get up to 40 degrees. And of course, all eyes on the stronger storm that is going to be moving out of the Rockies early next week. It's already generating a lot of chatter on social media, and rightfully so. Storms of this magnitude tend to be a doozy. Very heavy snow on the northwest side of it, potential blizzard conditions as well. Thankfully for us with this system, we're mainly on the warm side of it. This will bring us showers, thunderstorms, potential for some heavy rain. But when it comes to the severe weather threat with the storm on Monday, that's from Dallas through Tulsa, Oklahoma. So that's where the severe weather threat will start for the start uh, for the work week. And then it expands further east and becomes even likely in Louisiana and Arkansas. Now there is some potential that this may expand further north into Illinois in the coming days. But right now, I think that's unlikely. The best severe weather potential should stay across the lower Mississippi River Valley. In terms of rainfall, this is probably the best news of all. We're going to make up some ground here in terms of our ongoing drought conditions with a widespread one to three inches of rain looking like a good bet over much of the state. So here's what we know about this system. Showers and storms likely Tuesday evening through Wednesday. We can expect winds to gust between 30 and 40 miles per hour both Tuesday and Wednesday. And again, instances of heavy rain looking like a good bet as that system comes through. The nicest days of the week will come Sunday and Monday. By Wednesday, Thursday, cooler air starts to move up. We'll be back.
D News at 10. Brittany Griner is on her way home after a high profile prisoner swap. This comes nearly 10 months after she was detained in Russia for having cannabis oil in her luggage. She's expected to land in San Antonio tonight where she'll receive medical care at Brook Army Medical Center. CBS's Deborah Alfaron is at the White House with details. Video from Russian state media shows Brittany Griner leaving a Russian penal colony on her way back home to America. Happy. <laughs> the WNBA star was part of a prisoner swap for international arms dealer Victor Boot, known as the Merchant of Death. The two are seen crossing paths on this tarmac in Abu Dhabi. Congratulations. Griner's wife, Sherelle, thanked President Biden at the White House. Today is just a happy day for me and my family, so um, I'm going to smile right now. <laughs> Left out of the deal was Marine veteran Paul Whelan, who has been imprisoned in Russia since 2018 on espionage charges. For totally illegitimate reasons, Russia is treating Paul's case differently than Britney's. U.S. officials say including Whelan was a non-starter for the Russians in the months of negotiations, but they vowed to keep fighting for his release. This was not a choice of which American to bring home. The choice was one or none. Boot was serving a 25-year sentence for conspiring to kill Americans. Critics of the president say the U.S. should have gotten a better deal for him. There are answers that I need to receive before uh, I can applaud the Biden administration on this. Whelan's brother says the administration made the right decision, though the family is still devastated that he remains in Russia. The math is not going to work out for Paul to come home anytime soon. This is President Biden's second prisoner exchange with Russia. In April, Marine veteran Trevor Reed was traded for a Russian drug smuggler. Deborah Alfaron, CBS News, the White House. Tonight's extra effort winner has rejoined her team following knees, a knee injury, and she also runs a small business making cookies. Kurt Pegler has her story next in sports.
Now, your Sam Lehman Sports Desk with Kurt Pegler. It's the most talked about non-conference December basketball game at ISU in years. That's because it's taken years to make it happen. Over 30 to be exact. ISU hasn't played a basketball game at Horton Fieldhouse since December of 1988. That changes Saturday, and ISU's greatest ever player will be there to see this historic game. ISU hosts SIU Edwardsville Saturday, and Doug Collins is coming back for the game. He helped make Horton Fieldhouse a happening place in the 70s. Horton was also the home for three Redbird NCAA tournament teams in the 80s. For one day only, ISU returns to Horton for a game, and it's Saturday afternoon. It's very important as, as a head coach for me um, to take my team over there with a real appreciation for all those that came before us, all the players, all the alumni, all the fans that have seen games over there. Um, we want to wake up the echoes. Redbirds held a practice at Horton today, and those t-shirts that Ryan Peden was wearing with Doug Collins' number 20 on it will be given away to ISU students at Saturday's game. To Thursday night high school hoops, the Metamora girls have a big game with unbeaten Notre Dame on Saturday. Can't look ahead to that game when you're playing Prairie Central tonight. The Hawks came out shooting. Mariah Sisko slips the pass to Sawyer Ashman for two inside. And then it's senior Chloe Sisko frees herself up for a three. She scored 21 to lead the Hawks. They had an early lead. But it's a big night for Metamora senior Katie Ramage. A career high 25 points. Here's three of them. She also adds 10 rebounds for a double-double. And a nice floater here in the lane from Izzy Vandeschraff. Metamora, a 55-42 winner over Prairie Central. Big 12 game, Bloomington playing at Richwoods. Good night for Todd Hersey's team. This is Meredith Haynes to Michaela Burrell. Good passing for a Richwoods bucket here. Katie Barger with another terrific effort for Bloomington. Hoop and foul here. She scores 18 to lead her squad. But the Knights win. Burrell's going to grab the shot, which was short and score. It's a 51-24 Richwoods victory. Big game in the heart of Illinois Conference. It's DMAC playing at Eureka. And this is Eureka senior Ella Osmus nailing the three from the wing. But DMAC's Addie Swidinski will answer the ICC recruit with a three of her own. She can score on the outside. And here off a of steal, she's going to hit a pull-up jumper for a foul for a three-point play. Swidinski scores 28 to lead all scores, but Eureka wins it. Behind 27 from Ellie Cahill. Top of the circle jumper is good. Eureka 52 49 winners over the Chiefs. Ella Osmus in those highlights tonight, and the Eureka Senior is this week's Extra Effort Award winner. She's back after a knee injury wiped out her basketball season last winter. She's an honor roll student who has a cookie making business that she uses to help local charities do some fundraising. I started a cookie business in 2020. It's called Pand Ella's Pandemic Blessings. Um, it was originally to um, give cheer throughout the pandemic. I use it to help fundraise a little bit. And we've got more with Ella Osmus in an extra effort story. You'll find that at our website, ciproud.com. Big day at IVC. David Russell is the third IVC senior to sign a Division I athletic scholarship this school year. The state champion discus thrower signs his national letter of intent with the University of Northern Iowa's track team. It's nice, you know, I uh, worked a long time, you know, to hope to get to a point like this, you know, where I can sign somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I've decided. David says he'll study pre-physical therapy at UNI. Briefly, the Tremont boys and the Canton, Elmwood, Leroy and Illini Bluffs girls also won basketball games tonight.